we're uh, coming around the bend here to the final in our series of um, webinars. And I'm really excited about today's. Uh, by the end, uh, we'll talk about the final two uh, that we have presently scheduled um, with Jane Miller and Marcy Zaroff. But um, today we have uh, my friend Wayne Wu on and um, it's, uh, he, he, he's done the best branding of anybody, as you can see here. Of course, it helps to have a three-letter brand name. But, um, but uh, I've been really excited about this. Uh, you know, I'm going to just say to everybody here uh, publicly that, as a rule, I tend to steer clear of venture capitalists. I, I have uh, my own background, as I think many of you have heard, and my story is that I had about 300 individual shareholders. I don't necessarily recommend that either, but partly I had a very difficult time finding common ground with, um, well, finding any in, in, uh, institutional investors back in those days, but also uh, so many were on a tighter timeline than us. And, um, but the world has changed, it's shifted, and it's thanks to people like Wayne that we have, um, I dare say a lot of, a number of uh, really great, true partners out there who uh, real human beings who can take the point of view of the entrepreneur. And there's very, really uh, hardly anybody who does that better than Wayne. Um, Wayne uh, joined VMG in 2008. He became the managing director in 2016. And um, boy, if you're in the natural products uh, industry and you haven't met uh, Wayne yet, then that just means you're he just hasn't gotten to you yet because I, I don't, I, I've hardly met anybody he hasn't met. He d puts on wonderful dinners at expos, uh, just, uh, you know, getting the community together. He's helped introduce uh, entrepreneurs to Kroger and just done all kinds of service to our community. Um, and I especially wanted Wayne, as we're wrapping up our series here, to come in and uh, share both a little bit of his background as a uh, entrepreneur himself, and uh, I think that's really a, a fair and apt description, uh, but also uh, as somebody who really has an excellent pulse on what's going on out there. So whether as an investor, uh, Wayne will be speaking for himself, not for his firm, of course, but as an investor, as an observer, I think we can all learn a lot from somebody who is watching trends as closely as Wayne has and is. So without further ado, Wayne, thank you for joining us. It's uh, great to see you and thanks for being here. Same to you and thanks for having me on, on your show, Tales from the Trenches. And um, it's an honor to be here. And uh, you know, I really value our friendship and thank you for all the, the, kind, the, the, kind, the kind, uh, kind words to start. You know, like we've talked about in the past, I certainly miss our breakfast and, uh, yes. and hopefully we'll be in a, in a in a world where we can where we can do that again soon so indeed but, um as gary mentioned you know i have to start by saying you know these are my own views and not the views of uh vmg the firm uh that you see here behind me um just you know as a quick as a quick background um i grew up in houston texas to uh immigrant parents uh, my folks were from hong kong um I, you know, born and raised in Houston, I moved out to California to uh, go to college in the late 90s. I thought I was going to be part of the dot-com boom. It turned out to be the dot-com bust. Um, I think, I, you know, the, I think with the, with the pandemic, this will be the third, um, the third uh, economic downturn cycle of my, of my career. Um, and I've been out in California uh, ever since. I met my wife in college. We have three children, our son uh, who's 10 and then twin girls who are eight. I started my career. Uh, I thought you know, I thought I was gonna be part of the, the dot-com boom. I ended up starting my career as a public accountant instead. So I ended up starting my career at Deloitte. Um, that's where I, I learned sort of the, the nitty gritty of, of just basically all the, the small dynamics of how all the debits and credits that make a business move um, and really got down to the, the nitty gritty detail there. I spent a short time in investment banking at RBC Capital Markets um, where I saw how, um, how companies were merged and acquired, but also how capital was raised. 
And then I joined my first entrepreneurial venture as CFO and head of, head of corporate development, actually, in the automotive retail industry. Uh, the business was about one and a half billion in revenue at the time. And that's where I saw the power of brands. The actual differences between different brands of cars are actually, you know, pretty minute in today's day and age with technology. It's more about brand and just seeing the, you know, almost the ultimate badge of a consumer in terms of what they, how they either try to play up their persona or downplay it is often uh, can be, can be illustrated in how they choose to uh, what type of car they drive or, you know, how old their or new their car is. So um, I ended up uh, joining BMG as one of the first uh, junior members of the team back at uh, the beginning of 2008. And how that even happened was kind of a, I think in, in a, is, is unique in that I, um, I knew I wanted to transition out of, out of the automotive industry. And I joined this networking organization called the Association for Corporate Growth, otherwise known as ACG, and joined their San Francisco chapter. And, and when you get, after you do a number of interviews and you get accepted, there's a luncheon and you in, in introduce yourself at a luncheon in, in front of a, a couple hundred, in front of a couple hundred people. And I made this speech, hey, I'm, C, I'm Wayne Wu, I'm CFO of this automotive group, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, I, I love the transition into a, an investment private equity role. And um, as I walked off the stage into the luncheon, one of the co-founders of BMG, Scott Elaine Case, um, gave me her business card. She's no longer with the firm, um, but uh, but she, you know, I'll always be uh, hugely indebted to her because she she's the one who handed me that business card, and I and that, and from there met other folks from BMG and became one of the first junior members of the team. And this transitions over to BMG. BMG's final close of our first fund was summer of two thousand seven. So at the time when I joined BMG, we had only invested in three companies, Timbuktu Messenger Bags, Color Science, which is a Dr. Derm channeled uh, personal care brand, and Mighty Leaf Tea, I guess four companies. And then we had just invested in Wagon Train Pet Treats. Mm -hmm. So the fund, you know, what really attracted me to the fund was, um, you know, I know it's cliche to say, but it's the people. And, you know, the, the people and culture, um, even, in its, even in, its, in its infancy, was really stood out. And the opportunity to be part of an entrepreneurial venture to help build BMG has been something that um, has been just, um, you know, just something that, that where time has flown. And up to that point in my career, everything else seemed like a stepping stone where where it'd be to, you know, I wonder what would be next. Honestly, since January 2008, when I joined BMG, I wake up every single day completely fired up about what I do and who I do it with. And I think that's been a real, you know, that's been a real blessing. But as when I joined BMG, it was actually during economic downturn number two um, when I, you know, in my career. So during the great financial crisis. And um, as I mentioned, you know, our fund was formed solely to, to partner with entrepreneurs to help build iconic brands. And even during that downturn, I think what's been amazing during economic downturns is just the pace of innovation doesn't stop. And um, during the early time after I joined BMG in the 08, 09 period is when we um, partnered with Daniel Levetsky at Kind, Joey Herrick at Natural Balance Pet Foods, um, Rob Ehrlich at uh, Pirates Booty and the Wilson, um, the uh, Warren and Sarah Wilson from Pretzel Crisp. And, you know, those are some of the brands that we're, we've been, and entrepreneurs who we've been really proud to partner with. And it really shows that even during the midst of an economic downturn, that consumers are still trying to improve what they put in and on their bodies. And um, we've been proud to, to help support that. As you know, as it relates to our general approach, one of the things that I that really you know that I think we're very proud of is you know I think Gary described at, at, at the beginning of the show I think more of a general approach on how many investors approach the marketplace, which is they're deal hunters, they're 
smiling and dialing, making phone calls each week. And there's really no long-term dynamic to it. It's all just about trying to figure out how to deploy capital next week or the following day. And, and it's this hamster wheel that's very hard for many um, investors to necessarily get uh, off that hamster wheel if that's how they started. And we've always take a bear, taken an ecosystem-driven approach. And what we mean by that is, how do we support the flywheel to keep going around faster? How do we grow the overall pie so that there, there's, there's an opportunity for that pie to continue to succeed and that flywheel to go faster? So some of the components of that ecosystem are certainly entrepreneurs, retailers, and then the strategics um, who are, are either acquiring these businesses or developing brands and companies of their own. And we've always approached it with, how can we help support all these different pillars in a very genuine way? And where, where investment in deals are just a byproduct and happenstance in some ways, but our focus is really, how do we support every entrepreneur within, um, within you know, not only natural, uh, natural products, but personal care beauty, the pet food, pet treat space, um, the supplement category, household products? How do we support all these entrepreneurs? And don't try to over filter it on the front end of whether we think it's gonna be a good investment or not, or if there's a direct quid pro quo. It's really focused on how do we support how do we support the entrepreneur and and how do we support retailers and how they think about emerging brands um and how do we support strategics in terms of how do they keep these brands special and thriving after they acquire them what is the you know what's the right profile um and how do we help make the right introductions within that flywheel so that everybody succeeds and where it's not, um, it's not this, um, where again, there's not this direct quid pro quo where somebody's, um, where, where we're looking for some short-term benefit for ourselves. Um, we believe in the, the benefit of karma, where if we're doing the, if we're helping support this flywheel, that, that, that things, will, things will work out for BMG in the long run. From an evolution of the marketplace standpoint, it's been interesting to watch over the last 12 to 15 years. You know, as I mentioned, VMG was started right around the time of the great financial crisis. If we flash back that time, and I think Gary mentioned this as well at the beginning was, there was no, there really wasn't a dynamic within the space of series investment of, you know, C, series A or B or C. You know, it was very much a bootstrapped um, industry at the time. And, um, you know, entrepreneurs would start a company they have to focus on trying to be able to 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 find a place to manufacture it be able to sell it at a gross profit margin that was truly profitable because they were bootstrapped and as a result i found that in looking back that you know uh back in the the era of the the the, the great financial crisis generally businesses were um, started with better gross margins and um, they, they didn't, they didn't build, um, they didn't build the team for a hundred million of revenue the day when they had less than a million. They really, um, founders knew every facet of their businesses. They knew their formulas. They knew, uh, they knew every job because they did every job uh, along the way, knowing that they had to conserve cash in order to get enough scale to hopefully get to a point where they could get their first investor. You know, I think when you fast forward a few years as, as, um, as, some, as the, the strategic buyer universe started acquiring more natural products brands, there was a perception in the market that I think that there were, um, that, that strategics were just buying on growth rates and revenue. And I think that you saw a dynamic of both investors, more investors coming in this space, and then also more entrepreneurs coming in this space, both with this perception that, that strategics were only valuing growth or gross revenue. Mm. And as a result, 
you know, I think there was a lot of capital raised. There were a lot of companies chasing gross revenue where they no longer or didn't focus as much on building a, a you know, real gross margin. They, um, they were, in a way, entrepreneurs were in too big of a hurry. So they didn't, they didn't all, as, as a generalization, they may not have understood every facet of their business as well as the, the bootstrapped era, if you will. They were building their teams in a much more rapid way. And there's a fine balance to having enough team, but maybe not too much team too early and building too much cash burn where you, that you get on a hamster wheel of feeling like you need more revenue growth in order to generate enough scale to justify the team that was built to justify the capital raise. And, um, and some of that, I think some of that behavior may have been rewarded in, in, at, in, in that phase where strategics were buying some, some businesses that were focused on just solely gross revenue growth. I think fast forward to closer to today, call it the last 24, 36 months, you know, I think there's been a rightfully um, strategics have focused more on not only great brands with great growth that play in large categories, but also on, is there a real business model there? Um, do they have, do, do they, um, do they have the right gross profit levels? Do they play in a large enough category? Have they proven that they can sell in multiple channels? Do they have an e-commerce strategy? Do they have a scalable team? Um, do they have a logical a, um, innovation pipeline without you know, going too fast into too many, into too many categories? But I think a real, a real area of focus that is rightfully there is we're just getting back to the basics of, are we not only building great brands, but are we building real businesses with real gross margin, with true profitability, um, where um, there's not a rush for the exit? And from a BMG standpoint, yeah, we're, as, as ecosystem focused, as I mentioned, we applaud this. And we've always been focused on this from the very beginning of BMG. And also in all of our conversations with entrepreneurs along the way, those who we've invested in, but also just in general, that we that it's imperative to not only build a great brand, but also a great business. And the pairing of those two things gives a com gives a company financial freedom, and also it doesn't require an exit. You know, some of the best brands that have ever been built in the natural product space were never started for exit. You know, they were started at farmers markets that were trying to serve a, oftentimes a need that the entrepreneur or founders wanted to solve for him or herself in their own lifestyle. And it just, it, you know, and that passion um, ended up resonating with other consumers, which thus created a great business. And the, that authenticity and that building a business that wasn't designed or focused on, on exit created that authenticity that strategic buyers aren't able to necessarily create them themselves. As it relates to, you know, today in, in a, in a, in a, in a COVID driven in, in environment where we're sheltering in place in terms of, you know, market opportunities or, and, or watch outs, you know, I think it's really just building upon some of the dynamics that, that, um, that I just raised over that have happened already over the last 24 to 36 months, which is, you know, we, there's, it's the pairing of great brand building, but also, um, you know, uh, building the right business models. And as a result, you know, it, it, the, the watch out is liquidity and brands and entrepreneurs need to really think through what their liquidity runway looks like. And I think one of the, certainly the watch outs has been even pre COVID over the last two to three years has been company, entrepreneurs and brands who are not yet profitable have almost waited too long 
um, they wait too long to, to either alter their business model to drive more gross profit and get to profitability or at least break even or start raising capital early enough mm -hmm. so that they can withstand some hiccups along the way and not, uh, and not end up in a scramble for, for cash. So, and, and COVID only uh, accelerated that dynamic of, you know, capital raising may take a little longer. Um, the business may be a little more uncertain. So even, uh, even more so, um, entrepreneurs really need to think through their liquidity runway um, and, 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 and really plan for a variety of different, different scenarios. You know, from a, you know, uh, from an investor standpoint, you know, I can say at least from a BMG dynamic, we're still very much active and in business during this time period, just like we were during the great financial crisis during 08, 09. You know, we believe there's going to be phenomenal brands and businesses built during, during and after this pandemic. We continue to be uh, thoughtful. We believe in, um, in, in evolution. So, in, in that evolution is also how we meet entrepreneurs, how we diligence companies, how strategics will diligence companies. And we believe in the resilience of humanity and that we will all be able to evolve and, um, and find ways to, to, move, uh, to move business forward. Having said that, we have tremendous empathy for those who are not able to work from home. You know, and we feel very blessed that we are in a position where we can, but I think it's important to recognize those on the front lines and those who are essential workers that help move the country forward. Um, you know, we have tremendous empathy for um, and, and want to support them in any way we can, because these are difficult times. And, you know, the ones who are able to work from home are the fortunate ones like us, but it's important for us not to lose sight that there's, there's, very high in employment. There are those who are risking their lives and health on the front lines for the benefit of all. And it's important for us not only to focus on how do we drive business forward, but how are we supporting those out there that aren't as fortunate? Wayne, that's a fabulous overview. And I want to drill in and we're getting a bunch of questions. And I'll, I'll just encourage the audience right now to keep uh, using the Q&A box. We will get through uh, uh, as many of these questions as we can. Um, can you uh, talk to us about, uh, I guess, two different questions. I'll, I'll blend them together. One is sort of size of companies. What's sort of the mins that you would look at? Uh, uh, what are the proof points? Uh, but then also categories and i'm asking the latter question particular to the to the moment as you look at trends in uh this sort of post covid world you know which i don't think anybody's anybody thinks is going to uh go back to the way it was anyone who's who's aware of what of the of the of the ramifications and extent of this so i think people will be curious to know if there's areas that you are uh, more interested in or less interested in now? Well, I think broadly speaking, I think the, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's great that there's, there's investors of, of various stages um, involved in, in the, um, in the industry. And we look at a whole wide range, you know, for us, we want to invest in, in with great, with great entrepreneurs and great brands. So, you know, we've invested in brands historically that have been sub 10 million of revenue, and we've invested in brands with over a couple hundred million of revenue. And so for us, what's important is just do we have alignment on vision in terms of what we collectively want to build together? How will we surprise and delight consumers? And what type of business model are we going to pursue? Because like, you know, uh, like a good marriage, um, you know, vision, we need to all have the same values. Uh, we need to all uh, have the same, same vision on, on what, um, how we're going to approach that and what, we, what are we going to build. And, you know, I think there's so many challenges that come up along the way 
because investors and entrepreneurs and companies were inherently misaligned from the get go. Mm -hmm. And it's hard enough to build a company and business. And um, it's even harder, certainly when, when the, the, the views of what, what, um, what they're, what everybody wants to build are, are not, uh, not on the same page. Mm -hmm. And categories, uh, sectors, segments, you mentioned what goes in and on our bodies. Yeah. I mean, you know, for us, we're as, as on the VMG growth fund side, you know, we've been solely focused in branded food and beverage, personal care, beauty, pet food, pet treats, the wellness supplement space and um, high frequency household products. And, you know, we're, we're not, um, we don't change just like we did during the great financial crisis or we're, we're not changing or, um, you know, our view, you know, um, we're focused on these categories. We're focused on partnering with great entrepreneurs and brands that, um, that were, you know, hopefully successful, proven, continue to be successful from a velocity standpoint during COVID. But we also haven't turned our backs to categories that were strong pre-COVID. You know, I think for us, it's really just having it ascertaining, you know, in what environments would a given brand or category and environment will they, will they remain or get back to being successful? Because I think, you know, both, both of those profiles of entrepreneurs, brands and categories need support. And, um, and, so, oh, well, I was just going to ask, you know, alignment on vision. Uh, can you talk about exit in that, in that context? Because you've just mentioned you get in at various ranges, depending on that alignment in the, but, um, you know, as I said before, I, I have tended in my, on my boards and certainly in my own companies to not uh, be aligned with the exit uh, timelines of most funds. How about you I, I think in general, the investment community, you know, as a whole, um, you know, maybe they're, they're again, I, I think sometimes when it's all exit driven, there, you don't end up building the, 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 the right brands or businesses. Mm. So for us, we're focused on partnering with entrepreneur, you know, the right entrepreneurs um, to build iconic brands and exits if it's appropriate, will happen when they're supposed to happen. And okay. it's generally because um, there are acquirers who want to acquire versus a brand selling a company. So I think there's a big difference between selling a company and having a brand be acquired. And, you know, just like there's, um, you know, you know, brands find their stride and consumers are almost, you know, um, you know they uh, they hit their stride and and there's tremendous consumer demand and that yeah. momentum happens. It's almost like exit is in a similar dynamic. You know the most successful exits that brands have had in this space, the brands weren't really sold. They there was just tremendous dem buyer demand, and you know there was there must there, in in those situations there must have been alignment between their board you know, of that respective brand and company that decided that that was the best thing to do for the company. But yeah. I think, like I said, from the beginning, I think, you know, being overly exit focused is generally a detriment to companies and brands, and they should really be focused on just building a great brand and a great business and things will work out when they should in the, in whatever way it was meant to be. Yeah. So let me push, push you just a little bit on the COVID situation before we go to the questions, because, uh, you know, over six, seven weeks of doing these uh, webinars, and then, of course, two days with the Institute last week, um, we, uh, there, there are some clear uh, uh, mega trends happening within our space, right? Anybody who obviously was heavy into food service right now has had to scramble and I think I mentioned to you in the pre-call that at the beginning of our webinars, we asked people how worried you are about the next uh, surviving the next 60 to 90 days. And a huge percentage were quite worried. And, and in my view, those were 
there were two things going on. There was, uh, you know, chaos with the distribution supply chain to the retail, uh, you know, out of stocks and not, not being able to keep up and a focus on, you know, toilet paper and milk and eggs and, you know, just like, you know, must have da daily provisions. Um, but also, uh, you know, there was a scramble for companies who were uh, maybe less D to C and more, you know, uh, B to B. But now, of course, we've seen uh, the consumer has now gotten a taste of just how much they can get at home. And so um, just in the last week, with starting with the Institute and in the follow-up since, I've watched a whole bunch of companies, um, I think, overplaying their hand a little bit, just to feed you the question a little bit, that, believing that because they're kicking ass on uh, D to C right now, They've got, you know, what every investor is looking for. There's even one company I know who's talking about going public at a, like a $35 million sales rate because they're, you know, 60% of their sales are, are, uh, are, are, are uh, D to C and they're doing really well with Amazon. I, I feel like it's a kind of a misreading of the tea leaves. So I just wonder if you could talk to our uh, viewers here about, uh, you know, kind of do's and don'ts, uh, but more importantly, um, you know, have, have there been specific, um, when, I, when I say do's and don'ts, I mean, are, are there specific uh, trends that you're seeing with entrepreneurs trying to adjust to the current crisis that make you more confident and, and, and also the, some that make you more nervous? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think, we want to invest behind um, great brands and great business models. And the ones that are the entrepreneurs who are focused on building both generally have a nimbleness to them where they, they were never betting the house on, on any one thing. They were, they were, they, they, they've, they've looked at it in terms of running many scenarios. They weren't tied to a single channel or a single product or um or betting the house on any any one thing you know uh, and the ones who operate with real data too have versus just pure gut um you know where there's a melding of art and science have pivoted the, the most effectively so those that have uh, have access to data and where they can see what's happening in real time both in on the e-com side but also in the in the brick and mortar channels can quickly adjust to what's happening in the marketplace. And some of the things that seem to be, that, that will be more long lasting is, is just those that, you know, aren't knee jerking their way into, well, you know, e com solely the answer or brick and mortar is solely the answer. It's those that have a, a thoughtful strategy on how to pursue both as yes. well as evolving channels like click and collect where it's a bit of a hybrid model between e-com and brick and mortar and certain retailers like walmart target or kroger have really strong click and collect programs and to the extent that they're already in brick and mortar stores in these respective channels they can really accelerate their e-com related to walmart.com target.com kroger.com and then also Instacart on how they're blending the, you know, the, the, in a pure omni-channel experience for their consumers. So I think something that really resonates with me personally is just seeing the ability on how entrepreneurs are navigating, you know, change um, and how thoughtful they are about it and what level of depth and what, um, what their rationale is. And, and knowing that they're not only just focused on making a pivot for the short term, but what their long term thesis is on why they make the decisions that they're making. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, we do have, like I said, a bunch of questions. Just you made me think of one more for me. Um, the question comes to my mind Do you feel this is a unique? the whole sort of ecosystem approach, the win-win-win approach, is this, in your view, uniquely a VMG hallmark? Or are you seeing, you know, I've watched a lot more sophistication on the part of strategics 
for example, who, yes, they were initially into all growth, just go, 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 go. Uh, but, you know, many uh, have found their dreams dashed on rocks as, extern as unpredictable externalities came in. And I see a lot more interest. Uh, I think of, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Manifesto Ventures, Danan Group these days, uh, really looking to be more thoughtful about ways that they can synergize and build long-term value than um, you know short-term growth spurts. So, is it is it your sense that there's in, that that your views out there for folks who might or might not qualify for a look by you? Uh, are likely to find more investors thinking these ways. As you saw, about a third of our folks were investment is one of their primary reasons they're on today. So is the question, uh, is there more and in, more investors or more investment capital? More investors thinking the same way you are, or, you know, uh, or are you kind of in a minority with uh, not being as driven and focused on, on growth and top line as, has been traditionally the case with uh, venture capital. So maybe I'll put it into two different buckets. I mean, I think there's, I think it's great that there's, um, you know, being pro entrepreneur. I feel like the having more capital in the space is a good thing, and it, it, you know, I think ultimately it's good for the consumer because of the incrementality of change of putting better products in and on bodies, and having more investors interested in that space and help supporting entrepreneurs who are, are, are doing, are helping support consumers in that fashion is a great thing. As it relates to uh, a, um, a shift towards great brands and great businesses, I do feel like the space is moving in that direction. And I think yeah. that's, really, that's, a really great, uh, that's a really great dynamic. And I think, um, you know, and I expected to, you know, I, I expect it to continue. Yeah. You know, if there's one trend or one theme that has r run through the last two months of these webinars in the Institute, it's been uh, people are looking for authentic brands, brands that really touch them, brands uh, where the people behind them are, uh, d you know, showing compassion and understanding. Uh, in other words, the kind of long-term values, the kind of loyalty values, as opposed to the, you know, I'll try this, I'll try that kind of thing. So, uh, it seems like the marketplace is is, is a lot in alignment with what you're saying or vice versa. So look, we've got questions and they're all over the map. So be prepared. Um, okay, great. Uh, I mean, Peter and Gloria have both asked two versions of the same question. So I'll uh, just in terms of, um, you know, your point of view on the longevity growth potential in plant-based, immunity boosting, uh, organic, any hot areas that you're thinking about? I, you know, again, you've established clearly that you're more interested in the entrepreneur and alignment and sound business and win-win, but um, folks are still eager to hear if there are trends within that uh, catch your eye or at least that you guys uh, are inclined to look at more than others. It's interesting. You know, I think there's a point of clarification that's important you know, by taking this ecosystem approach, we've been much more focused on understanding what the, what, how the entrepreneur views these trends yeah, and how they're approaching it and what type of success metrics that they've put on their businesses and how they measure themselves and what type of success they're having. I think an example of that is we did not have a thesis, you know, 12, 10 to 15 years ago that we were going to be one of the more active investors in the nutritional bar space over that time period. There was no macro thesis around on the go snacking, meal replacement, et cetera. It was more again, focused on, we, we want to support entrepreneurs and we, we over time ended up speaking to every entrepreneur that uh, started a bar brand and happen to invest in a number of them, supporting them to build not only great brands, but great businesses. And so the, in, in where I'm getting at is, it ended up being those were the trends we happened to invest behind. 
I think we have a general view that if investors take too much of a thematic approach, almost a top down approach versus a bottoms up, they actually run into some challenges because they end up just in, you know, it's not an index fund in a category. They're picking spe specific companies and brands and they may not have invested in the, in, in the entrepreneur or brand or business that ultimately will help transform the category. Yeah. Um, so I think that clarification is really important. I, I don't have anything, um, but I, I don't think I have partic something that, that isn't talked about today related to plant-based or low carb or lower sugar, um, you know, to, to add, to, to add that that isn't already highly discussed in the space. Yeah. What what permeates and lasts will depend on the brand and how they positioned it. You know, are they are they do they put the name of the diet on their, you know, uh, on on the product? Does the plant-based product taste good? Does the texture right? Mm. Um are they banking on a single ingredient where the name the, the name of the brand is the ingredient? You know, there's du jour. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's dynamics where, you know, those are some potential red flags. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't look at it from a standpoint of like this, this is a winning trend versus this is not a winning trend. It's much more nuanced than that. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, it's so refreshing. And I hope it is for everybody listening just to hear talk about business fundamentals. I mean, I always in my uh, coaching, when, when the discussion moves around to financing, I, I often feel like the radical for suggesting that, well, you know, what about profits? What do you think about profits as a way to fund your business? And it's like a, you know, it's like a radical crazy man talking. So um, I know we know you were in Justin's and I'm, I've been looking over the portfolio. I'm not sure if there was many others who fit here, but Asher's asking, what are some drawbacks to tying your brand or brand name to the founder? Well, I mean, I think, I don't think I have anything, you know, overly novel. I think on the pro, you know, like, as we discussed earlier, there's uh, authenticity to that, you know, yes. it's, it's a real human being. There's a real persona behind it. Um, you know, it, there's, there's ways to, um, to build that brand around, around the authenticity and the personality of that of that specific founder or person. I think the downsides of it are relatively straightforward too. If, you know, if that, you know, we're all human. And if that human, you know, makes a, makes a poor life decision, um, you know, um, that could reflect on the brand itself. So the pro and the con is that it's tied to a, a single human being and we're all human and we all make mistakes. And hopefully it's just not one that um, that can severely hurt the brand at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, question about distribution. Anything that you're seeing that is exciting? You, you know, you touch so many uh, brands and sectors in your investing, but also in your uh, mentoring and your networking. Anything exciting you right now that you're seeing in uh, new channels of distribution and or particular... Uh, winning strategies in, in D to C or, or e-com? I think a couple of factors. I mean, I think, you know, in, I think one of the things that COVID has brought to light are supply chains mm. and who, you know, um, which retailers slash uh, and how in their go to markets are, are st perform stronger in a pandemic world versus others. And I think you know you're seeing certain retailers thrive uh, as much as you can in a in a challenging time like this, and you're seeing other ones struggle a lot more um, if they're if they have a certain go to market. And I I answer this question. I I don't want to name any specific retailers um, or go to markets, but I think you know you're seeing that dynamic. So I think it helps entrepreneurs think about which retailers that they lean, they, they, they lean into in at least short and middle, uh, middle term. Um, the second bucket would be e-com. Um, you know, again, I, I, I think if, if entrepreneurs are expecting immediate gratification on that channel, if they weren't already had <laughs> momentum there, 
I think, you know, like anything in life, there takes, it takes time. And this also takes time. So an investment in order to succeed, it isn't, it isn't magical by any means, but it is an important, if, if this was the wake up call that was needed in, in order for entrepreneurs and brands to invest behind their e-com side of their business and not solely rely on brick and mortar, well, I think that's, this is a, as good of a time as any to get started on that front. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the third bucket of the hybrid, you know, the click and collect programs, Instacart, where it's helping a consumer get product from, you know, without walking inside the physical store, either picking it up outside or getting it directly to their home that came from a physical store in their local geography. Like that's something that they should definitely crack the code and invest behind as well. Yeah, get the memo. So Colleen, speaking of retailers, Colleen asks, what are you hearing from retailers about their comfort level with bringing in new brands or line extensions, I suppose, in this environment? It's been interesting to see kind of how that's evolved, you know, since the beginning of March, you know, you had the, the frenzy and, and, you know, both brands and retailers were trying to catch up, you know, you're seeing promotions get canceled or resets pushed back. I think we're starting to land in a more uh, comfortable, not com I think comfortable is the wrong way to think about it. I think, you know, I think people are just getting more acclimated to the new norm and finding a way to think about how they will perform resets. So I think, you know, you're seeing more retailers uh, more receptive to new ideas. Um, I think it's, you know, I think just like no different than before, you know, I think it really comes down to how compelling is the brand or product and the bar is probably a little bit higher today. Yeah. And, yeah. and what will be the frequency of purchase uh, of that respective brand or category? And what will be the go-to-market? You know, I think retailers, and rightfully so, are super sensitive to out-of-stock issues and ability yeah. to supply. So uh, a given brand or entrepreneur, they, they need to be able to be prepared on how they're going to in, you know, get the retailer comfortable that they have the capital to be able to supply them, the supply chain to be able to supply them, and then the marketing resources to be able to activate it in a world where they don't have demo and, demoing and sampling. You know, so many of these natural product brands were built off, you know, demoing and sampling, which will be, which we won't have for the foreseeable future. So do they have the, the resources and skill set to activate their brand in a different way? Yeah. You know, uh, I've noticed something interesting happening with the brands I'm involved with lately. Uh, and I've seen it in, in um, uh, not just food and beverage, I've seen it in uh, uh, HB in health and beauty. Um, you know, retailer staff are pretty um, stressed. You said this earlier about remembering people on the front lines. You know, I've been, my son and daughter-in-law have been, they just bought a new home. And so I've been in Home Depot about eight times in the last three weeks helping them. And you know, you see these poor bedraggled folks working really long hours. They've got colleagues who are out because they're ill or because of child, children at home. And they're all working, you know, longer hours and harder and they're, uh, and they're also stressed, right? They're interacting with the public and it's not. And um, I've noticed that uh, uh, brands, uh, going into stores and offering what I did in my day, which is go in and help, help with the stacking, help move product from the back to the front, are really being appreciated. Uh, now, some, some retailers have prohibitions on this, but you know, if you've got gloves and a mask and you can get in there. One brand I, I'm dealing with uh, is in about 100 stores out of a big box. And um, each one that they've gone into, the people are just... They say, look, I can't get to it, but if you want to go for it. So this sort of uh, remembering that this idea of relevance of a brand with a heart might, you know, consider having, showing a heart to your, the retail folks who have to move that, that incredibly critical 100 feet from the back of the store to the front. Um, let's see, uh, somebody's asking about whether you guys provide mentoring and advice as well as funding, how you interact with your uh, investments? I mean, we spend a majority of our time, you know, with entrepreneurs, either in our portfolio or outside of our portfolio. And, 
you know, it, it, that's, you know, I, I think one of the things that we've taken a lot of pride in at VMG is being extremely active with our, with our portfolio companies and our teams. And, you know, I think off, there's been too many situations where I think investors are focused only at staying at a very strategic level. And I think to be, to be a very successful brand, it's not only nailing the strategy, but as importantly, but maybe more importantly, they're laser focused on, on nailing all the tactics that get them there. And those brands that are focused on being able to execute every, all the details and love the details, like it, to them, it's not a chore, but it's, it's that detail orientation that helps make them successful. We resonate really well with those uh, entrepreneurs and brands because we, we love not only supporting the strategic vision, but also supporting the, the tactical side of things and making recommendations on specific, um, you know, third party sort of businesses that could help them, but also helping build out their teams through our, our, um, our talent, our talent team that we have shout out to Cassie, uh, who runs our talent team, um, you know, with our, with our brands, but also the broader ecosystem. So, um, you know, we're laser focused in that. Yeah. I have to say, this is, this is what was behind my introductory comment about you as a true partner. Uh, your talent uh, operation is uh, astonishing. So uh, I, I acknowledge you. Cassie as well. Um, Don asks a very interesting question. How do you view brands that are self-manufacturers versus brands that use co-packers? And do you expect that view uh, to change in a post-COVID world? You mentioned, you know, supply chain has come into the focus. Do you see a, does that impact your thinking? I think it's a nuanced answer. Mm -hmm. So there's not a one size fits all on co-packing versus vertical integration. It really comes down to what does the landscape look like for production of that given product? If there's, if there's, um, if there's tremendous supply in terms of that, then I would question whether th th there should be vertical integration. If there's very little supply and the, 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 the product is extremely unique, well, there, that may be the only route and, and a good route to, to move towards vertical integration where that vertical integration creates a real point of difference. It's a barrier to entry for other, other folks getting into it. And that's a good use of capital as a result. So it really, it really depends on what does the landscape look like and yeah. what the, and, 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 and what the, um, you know, what, how, how will the payback on that CapEx look like in the likely incremental margin benefit yeah. from, from vertical integration? I, I have to say, just in my view as an angel and as an advisor, uh, I go back to an earlier comment you made when it comes to co-packers about putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, the, the, the high costs, CapEx costs and management costs and stress and hassles of owning your own facility are only eclipsed by being in, dependent on a manufacturer that you really can't control. <laughs> and so, um, you know, be, be wary. And, and, you know, this, I know from one, let's see, can I name names here? Yes, I can name names. I mean, one of the things, you know, sitting on the board of Forager, one of the reasons I think that they've really enjoyed such great growth of late is they built, they did the hard work, they bit the hard bullet of building their own facility in a, in a tough space. There's not just not that many plant-based manufacturers out there. I remember, you know, being part, associated with a brand that was doing uh, HPP back in the day when there was only one HPP supplier and whoever had the b biggest balance sheet and the most dollars was getting more time on that equipment. So, you know, be, be wary. Um, so let's see, uh, an anonymous attendee is asking if you see what you're sort of sensing or seeing or hearing from larger strategics, uh, uh, are they, um, are they, what's their appetite right now in this sort of COVID environment? And, uh, you know, are there maybe how you would compare it now to a year ago and 
you've already commented that you're personally not, or you guys at BMG are not as enamored or, or, or awestruck by faster growth as you are, you know, business fundamentals, but do you um, have any comments on what you think strategics are looking for? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, they're a, you know, they're a key pillar within the, the ecosystem. So we're spending a lot of time with um, a number of different strategics on how to support them with their entrepreneurial brands, how to uh, diligence in a shelter in place world. And, you know, I think I'm pleased to, you know, share that, it, it, you know, I think as a generalization, the strategic acquirer community is very much active. They um, they are working through their own um, processes on how they will diligence and meet companies through a a shelter in place environment. But um, you know, but it doesn't change what type. At the end of the day, um, it doesn't mean that they're going to acquire just acquire any company. You know, they're focused on not only again, as I mentioned earlier, not just great brands, but great businesses and. Yes. It's important that who play in large categories that have the opportunity for continued growth under their under their um, partnership and ownership. So, you know, um, I think what we've seen through two downturn economic cycles are great brands who are also great businesses who play in large growing categories. They they have they, they they're attractive to strategic buyers in good times and in more challenging times. Yeah, I would agree. It's gonna be, and it's not gonna be any different this time around. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, perhaps other than the uh, obsession that the large meat folks now have with plant-based, which is a sort of almost panicking going on out there, but I, I agree with you. Um, Denise wanted to press you a little bit further because you've mentioned it a few times. You, you know, you keep talking about um, strong businesses, deep, good fundamentals, good supply chains. But she wanted to ask you to describe in more detail what you mean by an iconic brand. Absolutely. You know, an iconic brand is, is one that has a that has tremendous consumer engagement. And it's one where there's, it becomes almost, there's, there's a, a deep emotional connection between a brand and its, um, and its consumers, where consumers evangelize the product. It's, um, it's, it's a brand where a, a consumer uh, is so excited about their brand that they wanna carry it around. Oh, and in a, the beverage category has been one of those types of categories over the years. Um, am I breaking up at all? I think yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the not, top. I think it's the top. It's the top. It's the top of the hour, and when people slam onto Zoom. Yeah, exactly. No worries. You're doing fine. Keep going. So, um, so the, the the beverage category historically been an iconic brand type of category because consumers carry their beverages around like a badge. I mean, they almost. I think there's a, a funny Jerry Seinfeld episode on you know how how uh, consumers carry their coffee cup you know, as, as a, like, almost like they're like the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, I think that's an example of what an iconic brand is, is one where a consumer is so excited about that given brand, they, they want to not only show it off to people, but tell everybody about something that they discovered, that they want credit for discovering and sharing with others, yes. both in physical in, 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 in terms of in the physical world, in meeting up with friends and family, but also on social, where they're talking about some, some, some brand or product that has changed their life. Yeah, I think it's true. I think the real uh, hidden uh, but essential benefit of loyalty is word of mouth. It's the most powerful purchase influence there is, right? Nobody believes especially right now, no one wants to be advertised at, but a friend, an influencer telling you this is an amazing brand, uh, that, that makes a big difference. Last couple of questions here. Uh, not sure if you have any uh, special insights here, but you're being asked by Ron, uh, when you think retailers will start seeing brand presentations in person, you're obviously connected to a couple of retailers. Will virtual presentations be part of the new norm? Walmart Open Call 2020 has been delayed as have many other retail in-person events. You seeing anything you can 
share? I don't have any unique insights other, you know, I think it's tied to the rest of the, you know, I think we all just got to look at the rest of what's happening out there. And, you know, if physical meetings aren't occurring in other industries, I don't know why we would see that be different in our, in this one. So yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the, I think one of the takeaways that, that I think it's important from, from this webinar is again, evolution. I think the brands that will thrive in the short and medium term will the one will be the ones who have been creative on evolving on how they're gener how they're how they're generating business. Yeah. So are they are they doing a good job of doing video conferencing with retailers? Um, do they have the right brokers who are thriving in a video conference world? Do they have a unique way of getting samples to category managers? Um, do they have good data resources? I think, you know, there's gonna be less of the, I think maybe some of the emotional decision-making sometimes right, right. where it's gonna be much more data-driven. Do the, do these brands have a, do they have data? Do they, do they purchase data? And do they have a way of sharing category management data with the category manager to help convey why a certain, you know, why they should carry that particular brand or product? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one part question from Elizabeth, but I'm going to add a second part. Are you seeing other non CPG investors coming into this space? Uh, and if so, are there certain types? And uh, my, my sort of add on here is, you know, with insecurity about the stock market, um, as folks have pulled a lot of cash out, is that, uh, and, and of course, uh, seeing the value of touchable products that really, really uh, impact people's lives. Is that, uh, you know, again, health, immune boosting and so forth. Are we seeing an influx of other kinds of investors at all? I don't think it's a change of theme. You know, I think you have, um, you have your, you know, the, as you mentioned, the corporate venturing groups, um, like to know manifesto, as you mentioned, or 301 Inc or others you have, so you have the corporate venturing groups you have the kind of long long standing like cpg investors like vmg or catterton or otherwise um and you have the vent the venturing the venture community that uh that depending on if there's like a food tech sort of dynamic involved or you know digital marketplace you know they you know there, there's that bucket too yeah, and um, you have newer funds in the CPG space that are you know that that continue to be raised to uh, to address this market. You have international you know international um, investors from Europe or Asia or otherwise that invest in the uh, invest the industry. So I wouldn't say necessarily new new buckets, but you see new entities within each of these categories. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, a question being asked, which I think you've answered, so I'm going to ask and answer. You correct me if I'm not. Josh was asking about your thoughts on long-term value um, of a company that has that's profitable, has strong margins, it's a strong brand, strong authenticity, but it's in a in a sleepy category. You know, not drinks, not salty snacks, in natural foods. And I think what you're saying is you you're much more focused on the entrepreneur and the fund and the business fundamentals um, than you are about the category. Is that decent summary? Yes. I mean, I think, but the, you know, I think in or for the category standpoint, I think, you know, they're off there. I think it's great that there's innovation and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship happening in quote unquote sleepy categories because you know, consumers need to incrementally improve what they put in and on their bodies in quote unquote sleepy categories too. Yeah. And there are certain categories where, where we don't, where there may not be a need for another me too uh, brand in that one. And, and I think it's great that there's other categories where people are looking where they are the, maybe the only innovative new brand in that space. Yes. And that's a great thing because, um, they're helping consumers solve a pain point for that, you know, within that category. And 
So I think that, that whoever that is that asked that question should be very proud of what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And uh, Paloma asked uh, if you, we're down to two last questions, Wayne. Uh, Paloma asked, what are some interesting emerging business models that you've seen helping business margins in ways that were not possible a decade ago? I presume she's referencing some technology, maybe some data access, that kind of thing. I mean, I think numerator is a, um, a, a great, um, a great resource. Um, it's a panel based, a panel based, um, application and platform that helps, um, helps brands understand not only how the category is doing in different channels and retailers, but also as it relates to, it helps answer the why, mm. um, you know, you can understand why there's lapsed users, um, you know, respect related to a given brand or product. You can understand why, you know, what, what's the primary purchase driver? Um, what's the, what's the trial to repeat kind of loyalty look like? It's one of the more um, innovative technological tools I've seen, I've seen in a while. Cool. And to be clear, you know, BMG is not an investor. In, I was just about right? to ask. We're not, an, we're not an investor in numerator <laughs> or anything like that, but it is something that I find, I hear more brands are interested in as a unique tool yes. to help support their businesses. Agreed, agreed. Um, last question, uh, softball for you. How to best engage with VMG and make the first contact with you if, if you're an emerging brand? Well, you know, if they're on LinkedIn, they'll probably be able to find, find me personally. Um, my email is woo at vmgpartners.com. And then I hope that folks will um, check out our podcast at, un, you know, Unfinished Biz our unfinished biz podcast um, where my business partner, Robin and I have a variety of different entrepreneurs on the, uh, on the show. So um, I'm not very hard to find nor is VMG. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our business model is, you know, and, and what we're passionate about is supporting every entrepreneur. So, you know, don't feel like, you know, you need to be raising capital to reach out. If, yes. if we can be helpful to you, reach out to us. We don't care if you ever raise capital or not. We just want to be helpful. Yeah, thank you. It really great, great uh, discussion and great place to end. Wayne, I like to uh, resummarize sort of key points that I've been hearing. I got a sunset uh, band of light here. I may ignore uh, here on the East Coast, uh, but uh, let me let me summarize what I saw. Some of the key points here, and if I got anything wrong. Uh, bark at me. Um, uh, your career began with an appreciation that uh, in the auto sector that uh, success often was more about the brand than the technology and sort of the storytelling, which I think is very appropriate to the time. Uh, even during downturns, the pace of innovation does not stop. Companies are still trying to improve what goes in and on their bodies during a downturn. Uh, you take an ecosystem approach to growing the overall pie. Uh, focused equally on entrepreneurs, on retailers, on strategics. Uh, you're very fixed on how to support so everybody succeeds, what I call win-win-win, supporting what you call the flywheel. Um, the uh, phase of institutions solely focused on growth and gross revenues have, has waned in favor of more business fundamentals, which you've made very clear throughout uh, our time together. And um, uh, you've mentioned that really pre-COVID, the last 36 months, strategics in particular have really focused much more on whether there's a real business model, multiple channels, innovation pipeline, gross margins, uh, et cetera, and business fundamentals uh, uh, that, um, you know, a lot of uh, the way investment used to happen was uh, encouraging maybe too much speed by entrepreneurs uh, and that's a, it's a refreshing shift from that. Uh, that uh, your new imperative, or the, you see the new imperative in the marketplace, uh, great brand and a great business. And of course, our business is building great business models and you, you shine a light as we have throughout. As you know, I begin every Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute with a, fix, a maniacal fix on cash flow, but you, you call it liquidity, but obviously one and the same. Um, uh, 
you're looking uh, much more for alignment on vision, particularly uh, do consumers, are, are, is the brand surprising and delighting? Uh, and you're not really changing your focus during the crisis. Uh, one thing you do have an eye out for is nimbleness. Uh, are entrepreneurs not tied to single channels or categories? Uh, are they using real data? I love this melding art and science. That's a very important point that I think gets missed a lot, especially by us uh, entrepreneurs who are so gut uh, driven. Uh, but, and you also underscore that COVID has really shined a spotlight on supply chains. Uh, it's been a wake up call not to just rely solely on brick, brick and mortar. And then of course you summarize your views of an iconic brand, deep uh, brands that have deep emotional contact with consumers uh, and generate real excitement. Those were the key takeaways I got. Any thing I, major I missed? No, I mean, I think, you know, I think the only thing is like, we've always been focused on great brands and great businesses. Businesses, I think that's been more of a broader, um, a broader evolution for maybe others, you know, but we've always been passionate in that. I think that's, you know, that's, that's what really builds tra a transform, a transformational company and brand. Yeah. I'm also very excited about your Thursday episode. Well, I was about to say, we have a nice plug from my, uh, so it's, it's VMG week here, folks. Uh, Julie, I don't know if you've got the slide with the final, uh, but Jane Miller, CEO of Lilies, who uh, is a, uh, an investment of, of uh, VMG and a fan of Wayne's. Uh, she had some very nice comments in the chat. Uh, we'll be on Thursday. We're excited about Jane too. And Jane, Jane is really a lot, of, uh, represents so much of what Wayne's been talking about. She's been in the big strategic. She's been in the trenches in, um, in uh, startup and emerging brands and uh, really uh, fa uh, fascinating and, and important, I think, leader, women leader in our space. And speaking of women leaders, uh, next Tuesday, Marcy Zaroff will join us. Uh, Marcy has been in and out of many uh, innovations in the uh, eco-fashion space, and she's always uh, fun. She's got some great war stories, so you'll, you'll look forward to that. Um, we are not going to have the panel on Thursday the 28th. Marcy will be the end of our, um, of our uh, series, uh, for, at least for the moment, until I'm badgered into doing this some more. So. Uh, Wayne, cannot thank you enough for uh, your wisdom, for your calm, and uh, really for your contributions to our sector. So thank you for being with us. Uh, Julie, thank you for being the uh, woman who keeps all this going. And everyone, thank you for joining us. And uh, we will see you on Thursday and stay safe.